Hey everybody, CVH here, and in today's video we're going to be doing something that you guys seem to like. Uh, a few videos back I went and I did a YouTube sort of exclusive game, not taken from a stream, where I really went in depth and talked about all my plays after the game. I voiced over it, and today we're just going to do another YouTube exclusive game where I'm going to talk over everything and explain all my plays, uh, but this time I'll be doing it live for you guys here. Uh, it might look like I have my stream set up, of course, because you can see all the stuff I usually have on stream, but I'm just using the same scene as I usually use. I assure you, I'm not streaming right now, we're just going to be going in. And the deck I'm going to use today, as you can see by probably the title and the deck list on screen, is Aggro Battle Mage. And uh, I talked about this a little before, on my stream at least. This version of Aggro Battle Mage sort of has uh, taken a couple of pages from the Merrick Battle Mage handbook. With uh, the Merrick and the Supreme Aftermancers and the Markarth Bannermans, and that's in order to give it sort of more of an edge against uh, slower decks, uh, control decks, and sort of a surprise factor against um, other mid range decks as well. And it's sort of to make up for the fact that Dark Rift and Gliders Arena have lost a good amount of their playability, and now we find ourselves up against a fellow Battle Mage player. So, of course, unsure whether or not he is Aggro or Merrick, but he's probably one of the two, given recent meta trends. Uh, I haven't played a ladder too dedicated in a couple days, as a matter of fact, so... Not exactly sure what to expect here. I don't remember playing against Kivja before. Let's see what he is. We should probably be able to figure it out in the first couple turns. A lot of the cards in the different decks, the two different decks, are pretty specific to each deck. For example, I've looked at a lit. Heavily signifies that it's Sagar Battle Mage. And one of the reasons I chose this deck is because A, I like playing it, and B, I like, uh, sort of... I like kind of trying to attempt to prove the stigma about aggro decks wrong. If I can. Uh, so he's playing in the shadow lane. If we try to contest in the shadow lane, he can have the field lane. I think we just try to take the field lane as soon as possible. Yeah, we don't have any favorable trades in the shadow lane either. Taking the shadow lane means he would get to uh, attack, then we'd have to trade, but he'd already be able to develop this, and he'd be able to develop this lane uh, this very turn, and that would be a sort of a problem for us. So I think we could probably make the case that trading that in is correct. I'm okay with that. If we decide to go face, we have it shackled, and we have this in the lane to contest each lane now. Not bad. Not a bad start. Cunning ally. This is surprising, isn't it? I'll tell you what's not surprising, if you look at the list I'm playing, is that it whiffed. <laughs> I did not expect my opponent to be playing Afflicted Alit and Cunning Ally in the same deck. So the two trains of thought now, which is more likely, is it an aggro battle mage playing Cunning Ally, or is it a Merrick battle mage, because they typically play Cunning Ally, playing Afflicted Alit? And the second option doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, so I'm going to say it's an aggro battle mage playing Cunning Ally. What conclusions can we draw? Maybe he cut a lot of the typical red cards for some blue cards, such as the Cunning Ally. Looking at my list, he probably isn't playing Groutwood Ambusher. Maybe he's not even playing Earthbone Spinner. Uh, he's probably definitely not playing Raiding Party or Mark Earth Bannerman at that point, right? Wonder what else is different. And I wonder if it's less prophecies. That could, that could uh, decide whether or not we attack this turn, as a matter of fact. I've seen some Aggro Battle Mages play Daggerfall Mage, but not so much Cunning Ally. Close ranks. Let nothing through. So as I'm still not sure what to expect, I'm going to make the safe player. We just take over the board, we've cleared what we needed to clear. And uh, we don't run the risk of hitting an early Prophecy, that could loses the game. Another cunning ally. Hopefully this one misses too. Do this. And it does, and that's pretty good. I wonder why he played it over in that lane. It's a little questionable. So our only uh, I don't know, really reasonable play seems to be the Sentinel Battle Mace. Unfortunately we do give him two cards, but hey uh, at this point we're just you know, kind of unsure what he's playing. Maybe it is, in fact, American Battle Mage with Afflicted Alit, so we're just gonna go in, actually dodge two prophecies. It's, it's a little insane, and uh, I can't imagine there's a great answer to this 8 2 ward guard from his deck. Now, if he had hit these cunning allies, if he had gotten the prophecy, we'd be in a. We'd be singing a different tune right now. So that's probably one of the best answers he could have had. We still retain a body on the board. Uh, we are able to afflict it a lit, break our own rune, see if we get a prophecy. I think I do want to play it in the right just in case I want to trade next turn. Don't have that option this turn quite yet. Probably Ravager to follow up. Could set ourselves up for a good Gratwood Ambusher 
if we wanted to raiding party now. He can deal a max of six. I got him at 16. I think I'm just going to play the Greystone Ravager in the right. If he's playing Gratwood, this is a huge issue for me, though. Honor and blood. But it's a huge issue no matter where I play this, and I'd rather have it over here. This should be good. In case he has a Rapid Shot or Firebolt to uh, deal with one of these. I'll still have something else on the board to trade. Hopefully he doesn't play Gratwood Ambusher. And if he does, hopefully he doesn't have it. He's gotten rather unlucky so far. So here's hoping. Let's roll the dice. Sometimes it's how you got to play it. Overall looking pretty good so far, I'd say. Pretty okay. Of course, a lot of it's going to come down to how aggressive he's able to get. Whether or not we hit any prophecies. So far, it does look like he's running less prophecies than the norm. Or at least we haven't seen any yet. I'm sure they're in the deck. I'm sure at least a few of them are in the deck. There's some that are just too good not to play, of course. I'm still totally unsure which kind of top end he's playing in this deck. I could see an aggro battle mage playing Cunning Ally, yet not going for the whole late game package that I'm going for. Alright, so like this pretty much guarantees that it is in fact aggro, right? Makes a lot of sense. Prophecy time. It is, in fact, prophecy time. That's a pretty good one, too. Uh, where do I want it? My arrow shall fly true. I'm thinking we the go for Markarth. Okay. No, uh, not Markarth, Grat would excuse me. That's the card I meant to say. So we have two damage in the left. In the right, we can clear the 3-3, three, three, attack the 3-2. Gratwood down to where he only has a 3-2. We're not really applying a whole lot of pressure. That's the downside. That other Earthbone Spinner was uh, was pretty good. I would much, ra would much rather have played a, like a Grace on Ravager or something. Fortunately, I think we can stop worrying so much about prophecies. We could, in fact, just Fate Weaver and try to high roll really hard. Uh, let's see what happens if we whiff. We still trade the 3-1 to the 3-3. Three, three. He has 6 damage. Don't think he can straight up kill me, even if I whiff, unless I hit a Prophecy in this lane. Um, I think overall the play is stronger, though, as far as setting up more of a chance to kill him soon, if I hit anything. Fate Weaver into Fate Weaver was nice. Oh, that's good. Well, that turn was kind of a clown fiesta, but I think we eventually found the right play. We just didn't give ourselves a whole lot of time to think through uh, the, the tons of possible outcomes of Prophecy into Prophecy My Face, you know, etc, etc. But thanks to the Camelorn Sentinel. Yeah, he played that Lightning Bolt on my face really fast. I'm pretty sure he could have killed me. Maybe he can still find a way here. Been an engaging hunt. The day is mine. The egg of fun. We can indeed find a way. Alright, so let's try to redeem ourselves with one more game on the ladder. I believe. Cast out was a little surprising because not only is it a cut from some lists, as you can probably tell, uh, but it is also red, so I don't know. I don't know if I like the interaction between that card, if you're keeping that and you're playing a lot of red, probably, on the Cunning Allies, which, you know, we saw them miss twice, of course, this game would probably have not have been that close in the first place if he had hit either one of them, especially both of them, that would have been pretty terrible. So we have a non-legend rank 3 scout. Our deck should be very good against scout thanks to these, unless it's a crazy aggressive scout. I'm obviously not going to keep him my opener, yeah, that's fine. Alright, so we have a two drop, we have follow ups, it's all good, and we do have a Supreme Master Mancer just in case we wanted the assurance, <laughs> which we really didn't need, but it's in our hand now. Fate Weaver, obviously not a great draw, but it's okay because we have plays and they're pretty good. So. Should probably figure out which kind of scout he is quickly. More than likely ramp. I've seen a few mid ranges, but they're outnumbered like I would say 75% are ramp scouts. 
So we could play Sentinel, we could play Hero. Hero pushes more damage at the start, and I don't really think there's a compelling reason to guard. Yeah, I'm not really seeing it. If he had Murkwater, which I'm pretty sure he would have played it right there. I used to be an adventurer like you. And hit a prophecy, that's good. Yeah, not hitting a rune and then breaking a prophecy would be one reason to play Sentinel there, but I don't think, given our deck's game plan, it's correct to do that. It's a little too defensive, a little too weak. Fair enough. Ooh, another one. Or something. Another something. It's a bit annoying, but that is a pretty fantastic draw. Gotta think about placement somewhat. I think we just keep piling it all on the left, to be honest. My shall fly so we find something to do next turn, hopefully. Uh, we have a lightning bolt that we can fire off. If he plays a Hist Mage to contest my field lane using the Ring of Magicka, we can just trade in the 1-1 one, one and use the bolt to finish it off. The forest is more Thought it was going to be the Hist Mage, but that is okay-ish too. This Mark Arth Bannerman was a pretty huge draw. Uh, I'm just going to go all face, Stand fast. Fire. drop the Mark Arth on the right, where the only answer that's commonly played should be Shadow and Priest. Take you. <laughs> if he has finish off, it's going to be disappointing. Alright, alright, alright. Crushing blow. Not entirely common nowadays. Fate Weaver in the right. So we don't immediately die to the Leaf Lurker the following turn. Let's see what we get. We could play this in the left and shackle the Leaf Lurker. Wouldn't mind taking back over the field lane leading into the Atromancer turns coming up. Hopefully they can allow us to close the game out. Would have been nice if that Mark Arthur had lived, but at least his answer wasn't incredibly efficient. Crushing Blow is a good card against us. Murkwar, which is a good card against us. He basically had to use both. Um, could have been Shadow and Priest, which impacts the board a little bit more. He would have had to deal with that, or it would have traded with things as well. Will not, save you. not I believe early is definitely not great. So I definitely want to raiding party. Definitely want a raider. And I think we save the other Nord. Also begs the question, I think we might just trade in here. So if he equips a Snake Tooth Necklace to it, he has to hit my face. And then it gives me another card. Time to fight. I have no fear. Unfortunately, he's done a pretty good job of stopping damage. So while we have a good play, a turn from now, and by a turn from now, I mean like a turn from the following turn. Uh, turn 9, obviously. While we have a good play, it might not be quite enough. Our board is incredibly weak and vulnerable. On the plus side, he is out of the Ring of Magicka. He hasn't ramped yet. Hopefully that's his only guard. He's just going in without even the Snake Tooth Necklace. That's aggressive. That's super aggressive. He's got to have a good hand for that. Ooh, Black Marsh Warden. Black Marsh Warden, huh? Well, I can clear this. I didn't really think I'd be in the business of clearing. But uh, using the Battle Mace and the Lightning Bolt, I can clear everything here. I think that's probably fine. We should Lightning Bolt that, Battle Mace this, trade that in. And actually keep this alive. The Nord in our hand for the future. Black Marsh Warden. Maybe he's just playing because he loves his premium Black Marsh Warden. You must be cleansed. A lot of that play was questionable. Since he attacked after playing the 4 4 to give me more information. The only possible reason to silence that first is if I get a lightning bolt and decide to lightning bolt his face, but playing that first would ensure that I lightning bolt that anyway. So a little confused at that. We don't have any really good attacks for the Nord Firebrand. 
It could just simply be used as another two damage, of course. Which is fine. It is fine. I'm worried this is a bit too fragile. If we played this and this, we could kill that. Then next turn, what happens? We have four damage. That puts him at... Well, let's say these both live. That's six damage. Puts him at 13. Then we have three Nords, so we have ten damage from the Atromancer. And then three damage from the Nords. I just don't think it's quite safe enough. That was a misplay, I should have attacked with this first. Did not count correctly, luckily not punished. I think converting that into 3 damage as opposed to 1 is probably the best we can do now. It's likely something sticks that we can Merkle Gatekeeper. One of the scariest things here is probably Red Brahmin. Fortunately, Odavang is still a ways off for him. You must be cleansed. Wow, I was about to say, but it seemed a little too absurd to mention the possibility of him going face there. Five magic left, what on earth could he possibly do? I am just a little shocked that he would make that face attack. Well, that's guaranteed now. Blasto played that incredibly aggressively. But we managed to pull it out, thanks to Supreme Atromancer, uh, showing why the top end is pretty solid in this matchup. So that's a little bit of aggro battle mage on the ladder, a little bit of against another aggro deck uh, with some interesting card choices, and a little bit against a, a slower deck with some interesting, I would say, play choices. So hopefully you all enjoyed uh, the sort of uh, in-depth commentary, gameplay, etc. If you like, feel free to, to like the video, subscribe to the channel for more strategy videos, back to top 10 feels good, and I will see you guys next time.